Brian Palmer, the floor, Zoom floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks very much to Michael for arranging and uh, um, publicizing this event and to the Marxist Education Project for the work that it's doing. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk about the uh, second volume of uh, the work I've been doing on James P. Cannon, uh, a book that will come out with Brill uh, in the Historical Materialism book series. Uh, I think the final the date of publication now is December the 8th, 2021. Uh, it's entitled uh, um, James P. Cannon and the Emergence of Trotskyism in the United States, 1928 to 1938. Um, and I thought what I would, would try to do briefly is, is just to address why uh, the book was written, what it covers, uh, and in some senses why I think uh, it should have a, a readership um, of, a, of particular kinds, not just a, a solitary readership of those interested uh, in the history of Trotskyism. Um, although that is uh, a, a primary consideration, and it should be said that that's really why I wrote the book. Um, so the first uh, aspect, the first component of the book is that it is a history of Trotskyism in its original decade of formation in the United States. It's a deep dive uh, into the archival record, and as such, it's uh, unprecedented. Um, it, it's never really before been done. It, uh, the book probes fully the James P. Cannon papers, which constitute 65 reels of microfilm at the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. Uh, it draws as well upon the papers of Max Shackman, of George Brightman, and, and, and Frank Lovell. Uh, all of them uh, deposited the Tamamont. Uh, I actually looked at the Lovell and Brightman papers before they were deposited. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, it looks at the public, published uh, record of the movement of Trotskyism, uh, as well as a wide array of, of secondary sources. Um, it probes... Um, the internal dynamics of the left opposition uh, in the United States, its relations with Trotsky himself, but also the, uh, the tensions, uh, the factions, uh, the personal relations of the major, of the major figures in the movement, uh, as well as their activities uh, on the ground in various kinds of mass work. Um, it explores as well the shifting alliances and programmatic clarifications uh, among Cannon and his associates, as well as their relations with other ostensibly revolutionary organizations and the splits, fusions, and entries that resulted. Um, it's compared to uh, other treatments of Trotskyism like Constance Meyer's The Prophet's Army. Uh, this is a very different book. It's, it's, uh, it's very large. Uh, it's about, it'll be 1,200 published pages. Um, and uh, it draws on insights of previous work, of course, like Alan Wald's The New York Intellectuals, but it deepens the discussion uh, with its recourse to the rich archives of material that were really unavailable uh, to Wald and to, and, and to uh, Myers before him and to many others. Now, if this were the book's only contribution uh, of basically providing a history of Trotskyism in its formative decade, uh, that in and of itself, I would argue, would be enough. Um, but in fact, uh, I'm convinced that there are other uh, um, aspects of the work, and because of its, its sort of uh, um, deeply contextualized uh, nature, uh, there are other uh, areas where it should draw readerships outside of those uh, fundamentally interested uh, in Trotskyism. Uh, for instance, the second area that I think uh, um, uh, the book makes uh, a contribution uh, and a significant one is that it inevitably sheds new light on the Communist Party, uh, a party that was hegemonic on the left in some senses in the in the period that I'm talking about, the 1930s. But that is also, if you want to, if you if you if you want to say this, it's been hegemonic in the historiography. Uh, the Communist Party has been really uh, the uh, area of interest for historians of the left. Um, uh, uh, writing uh, about the 1930s, so much so uh, that it has dwarfed uh, consideration of other movements, of which I think Trotskyism, for, for me, is the most important, but one could also argue uh, about anarchism and, and other developments. Um, and in this, uh, um, uh, in, in the light that it sheds on the Communist Party, it, of course, 
uh, looks at the programmatic differentiation between Trotskyism or the left opposition uh, and uh, the Communist Party around questions uh, uh, like uh, socialism in one country, Stalinization, and the common terms de uh, degeneration. Um, but it also looks at Stalinist uh, politics uh, as they are uh, evolving uh, in terms of opposition to Trotskyism and in terms of how they functioned uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, developments of the 1930s. And as such, I think it poses a, a, a fairly significant challenge to those who have been uh, um, uh, uh, enamored of the, of, the, of the significance of the Communist Party. Um, significance is the wrong word. Enamored of uh, and, and uh, um, aligning with, in a loose kind of way, the Communist Party for the good work that it did. And, and of course, the, the, the Communist Party did a great deal of good work, but it also uh, was characterized by a degeneration uh, that was quite serious and that imported into the workers' movement hooliganism and thuggery that had been unknown. It was borrowed from the labor bureaucrats of the 1920s, um, people like, like John L. Lewis. And I present the first, I think, serious and sustained discussion of uh, the violence of the Communist Party against the left opposition and against Cannon and his associates. In virtually every town where they tried to put forward the ideas of the left opposition, where they organized labor forums, uh, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the Trotskyists were met but with physical intimidation, violence, uh, and uh, on one occasion, at least in the early 1930s, uh, this resulted in two deaths, sadly, of actual of Communist Party figures uh, uh, in, uh, who, who were uh, on the street when uh, concrete uh, um, uh, projectiles were tossed off the top of a building. Um, I build as well on the, uh, um, and extend, I think, Christopher Phelps's revival of uh, Max Shackman's Communism and the Negro to show that uh, the critique of the Black Belt Nation thesis uh, uh, is not only a contribution of the Shackman, Glotzer, and Abram contingent, but also was uh, um, uh, uh, developed uh, with the active involvement of uh, canon supporters like Hugo Oler. Um, and in the Communist Party's uh, Black work, uh, its anti-racism struggles, which are critical, and which uh, Mike Goldfield's, uh, for instance, uh, Southern Key has recently elaborated on uh, um, insightfully and, and uh, with great detail. Um, one can see in this work uh, a lot that's great, but one wonders why it needed to be premised on uh, a, a notion, the Black Belt Nation thesis, that was both uh, lacking uh, in appeal to the vast majority of Blacks, uh, in the South, let alone those in the North, uh, and why such an unmarxist uh, um, formulation uh, was necessary to the struggle for Black equality, the struggle for, uh, against Black unemployment, uh, the struggle uh, against lynching and uh, against uh, and in favor of and in defense of the Scottsboro Boys and other causes, uh, why uh, the struggle for industrial unionism needed to be uh, scaffolded on this uh, um, rather, uh, I would say, uh, bizarre uh, understanding of where Blacks in the United States were located. Uh, I also uh, go into, in, I think, in, in, in detail that a few others have done, the opposition to the Moscow trials, the creation of the Dewey Commission, uh, the Trotskyist critique of uh, uh, um, the Communist Party's approaches uh, to, uh, to the popular front and in particular to the Spanish Civil War. And in all of this, uh, I think uh, it poses it's like a series of uh, fairly acute challenges uh, to much of the historiography that has uh, focused very much on the Communist Party and its contributions uh, in the 1930s. So that's the second area uh, of interest. Um, the third area uh, of interest that I think this uh, um, book contributes to 
is the uh, is to basically to the labor history of the 1930s. Um, it reframes, in some senses, issues of trade union militancy and working class upsurge, uh, and it does so uh, predictively by looking at. Uh, events like the uh, that, that took place in Minneapolis in 1934. Uh, those who've read my book on, on the Teamsters will not be on the Teamster Rebellion. Um, will uh, not be surprised. I, I, I juggled with the notion of kind of removing that that long section. Yeah, I think someone does need to mute everybody, maybe. Brian, I can't find who it is. Someone's in a restaurant, and they need to <laughs> turn their thing. They stopped. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> I, um, I, re I wrestled with the notion of, of cutting back significantly on the Minneapolis chapter. The book was so large, and I had originally written that, that, that book on the Teamster Strikes to actually be part of this canon work, uh, that I decided to just basically uh, leave that. It's it's revised somewhat, but to leave uh, the detail of that chapter in. But more than Minneapolis, uh, I contextualized the 1934 uh, upsurge and the the mass strikes of that year, uh, which were the preface to the uh, CIO organizing campaigns of three years later. I look at the New York uh, hotel strike in considerable detail the role of B.J. Field and his falling out with the Trotskyists and them, and them with him. Uh, I look at uh, the Illinois miners uh, campaigns that uh, Cannon and others were involved in. And, in, and I, I spend some uh, considerable time on uh, Cannon's uh, work on the West Coast uh, among the Pacific uh, Sailors Union uh, and, and some time on uh, auto organizing uh, in which Cochran and Clark were, were central figures in, in Ohio and Michigan. Um, so, the history of Trotskyism, the history of the Communist Party, uh, the history of trade union militancy, and uh, of the political organizations that go along with this. I mean, all of this really is that it, 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 canon is central to this. He's a red thread of continuity, and in some senses, this uh, he, he poses an acute challenge to the historiography, uh, the dominant historiography and its bifurcation into uh, a traditionalist uh, versus revisionist uh, um, interpretation. The traditionalists uh, who align with the uh, interpretation of Theodore Draper and more recently with uh, uh, Harvey Clare and, and, and his uh, co-author uh, Haynes, uh, have argued, of course, that uh, communism in the United States was never anything more than uh, a Soviet, uh, um, uh, uh, Soviet-orchestrated and determined uh, mobilization. Uh, it's been opposed by a revisionist historiography uh, of new left-inflected historians um, who see in the radicalism of the CP a, an indigenous uh, development um, that uh, um, mobilized against uh, racism, that orchestrated struggles of industrial unionists, that fought uh, for the unemployed, and that engaged in a, a, a variety of social justice causes. Um, for the uh, revisionists, then, Moscow domination uh, is not the central uh, uh, strand of the history, history of the Communist Party, but rather uh, it, a Native American radicalism uh, that's uh, fighting uh, just fights and uh, struggling for uh, um, human emancipation. Um, now, I think Cannon complicates this bifurcation in you know, fascinating ways. He was no puppet of Moscow. He broke from them decisively. Uh, he broke from the common turn uh, at the time of its degeneration, but he did see the guidance and the validity of the original Bolsheviks, uh, the revolution of 1917, and the importance of their contribution in founding the Communist International in the early 1920s. And uh, he looked to Trotsky uh, as a fundamental guide uh, in this moment of degeneration. And he, uh, he learned from both uh, uh, international developments, 
uh, and was himself plugged into uh, the very uh, national circumstances and context that uh, the revisionist historians uh, um, see as primary. So um, in all of this, uh, I think uh, the irony is, is that Cannon, uh, who's largely been ignored uh, in the historiography of both uh, the traditionalists and uh, the revisionists, uh, poses a, a, a challenge uh, to, uh, um, to their understandings of uh, uh, their, their similar understandings, I need to stress, of uh, an equation of Lenin, Leninism equals Stalinism and uh, therefore a dismissal of Trotskyism. Um, because in some senses, the, what I argue in the, in the kind of historiographic introduction to the book is that the uh, traditionalists and the revisionists are mirror images of one another. They both see uh, a kind of original sin in Leninism. Uh, they see it evolving into Stalinism, and they see Trotsky as really uh, equated with, in some senses, uh, the, what's wrong with uh, that uh, entire tradition. Uh, Cannon, um, to my way of mind, uh, separates out Leninism from Stalinism, as does Trotsky, and uh, looks to preserve uh, the um, uh, uh, gains of, of October and uh, um, carry those forward into the str class struggle politics of the 1930s. Um, now, I'm not uncritical of Cannon. Uh, in the dog days of the early 1930s, when he was at loggerheads with virtually uh, um, uh, an entire corpus of younger comrades whom he had uh, been a mentor to in the 1920s, Shackman, uh, Avern, Glotzer, uh, Spector. Um, there's no question that his demoralization and his abstentionism uh, led to critiques, even from some of his uh, most uh, uh, stalwart uh, supporters, uh, like Arnie Swabach and uh, Vincent Ray Dunn in Minneapolis. Um, I'm, I, I raise all of that. I go into the reasons for Cannon's uh, demoralization and crisis, uh, which I think are understandable. Uh, they relate to the context of the early 1930s, the failure of the left opposition to grow, the increasing hegemonic hold on the left of the Communist Party. But nonetheless, uh, even in these periods, in, 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 in the periods of, of his deepest uh, um, depressions, uh, and his partner's uh, uh, breakdown, Rose Karstner, uh, Cannon nevertheless stayed with the movement and was a fundamental force within it. Um, he did have to shed some of what he had learned uh, within the Stalinizing movement of the 1920s, and Trotsky himself warned Cannon uh, a number of times against using organizational authority to stifle political difference and override uh, the prematurely uh, the uh, uh, articulation of uh, programmatic uh, um, clarifications. Um, there, was, there were times when, uh, particularly uh, in the later 1930s, when uh, Cannon perhaps drifted towards uh, Stalinophobia. Uh, um, but his critique of Stalinism uh, in Russia and in the U.S., was absolutely on the mark, I would argue. Uh, and there were, you know, when one looks at what went on in terms of the thuggery, in terms of the Communist Party's uh, really slanderous treatment of uh, communist dissidents like Cannon, uh, the Stalinophobia, uh, if uh, unfortunate and wrong-headed at certain times, uh, um, nonetheless is understandable. A couple of instances of this, uh, really that I, I don't have time to get into in any, um, you know, uh, uh, detailed way, was that uh, at the time of, uh, uh, in the aftermath of the uh, victories of the Trotskyists in Minneapolis, uh, there was a, um, uh, a, a, a Teamsters leader, Patrick J. Corcoran, who was murdered. Uh, it, to this day, it remains unclear, but it was almost uh, uh, certainly 
uh, uh, gangster elements associated with the thuggery uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, Tobin Ivy uh, International Brotherhood of Teamsters, um, perhaps aligned with the employers, but uh, s- perhaps uh, uh, um, sort of paying back Corcoran for having uh, sort of abandoned uh, 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 their approach and aligning with the Trotskyists uh, to make great gains in the uh, 1936-1937 period. Anyway, Corcoran's murder unleashed a, uh, a series of uh, allegations um, in, the, uh, um, in the Communist uh, Party that uh, this was a consequence of the uh, Trotskyist control of the movement and the Trotskyists were responsible for the violence and, and deaths of, uh, of uh, death of uh, Corcoran. Uh, Cannon actually uh, suggested to the Dunn brothers and others in Minneapolis that they pursue a libel action against the Communist Party, uh, the, its newspaper, The Daily Worker. Uh, and uh, I think this was a, a you know, a, a very much a mistake. Uh, nothing came of it really. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, the, the libel suit was in some senses uh, a victory, but uh, in, by the early 1940s, when, that, when, it ran, when it ran its way through the courts, uh, the whole issue had long been forgotten and very little uh, really was made of it. And the Teamsters, uh, led by the Trotskyists, were uh, in, the, in, the sort of, uh, in, a, in a very much larger fight with Dan Tobin, with uh, the Roosevelt Department of Justice and others who were uh, pursuing uh, um, charges, you know, charges of treasonous activity against them. Um, and Cannon could be as well too dismissive of the Communist Party-led uh, CP unions, uh, which, he, which on one occasion at least, uh, he, uh, he, he placed outside the workers' movement, which I think was uh, um, a, uh, uh, an unjustifiable uh, position to be holding. So I do raise criticisms of Canon, um, but I also am, uh, uh, as I think no one will be unduly surprised to hear, uh, very much uh, um, uh, an advocate of his amazing accomplishments uh, and uh, the significant role that he played uh, uh, in the 1930s in the sustaining uh, of uh, the Trotskyist movement. Um, a group of a little over a hundred brought together by Cannon uh, in 1929 had managed to consolidate a left opposition of considerable presence in the 1930s. It had led major strikes in New York hotels uh, in Minneapolis. It had influenced West Coast seamen in the later 30s. It exercised a presence in the early United Automobile Workers. It fused with A.J. Musty's American Workers Party, uh, and it continued work uh, that that body had developed in the unemployed movement. It countered the sectarianism of uh, Hugo Oler and others who broke with Cannon uh, over uh, not just the fusion uh, with Musty, uh, they went along with that, but with the entry into the Socialist Party um, later uh, in, the, in the mid-1930s. Uh, Cannon and others uh, orchestrated a movement that pursued labor defense mobilizations and that combated Stalinism uh, in the process, in the Free Mooney uh, campaigns of the decade, uh, and they convinced reluctant liberals uh, like John Dewey to fight to clear Trotsky's name from the vicious and potentially lethal uh, slanders of the Moscow trials. Um, Cannon and, and uh, his, uh, his allies entered the Socialist Party and expanded the ranks of revolutionary Trotskyism significantly, uh, and uh, in some senses, the, the very lengthy chapter on uh, fusions and entries, um, to my mind, constitutes the most original uh, um, uh, component of this book, uh, in particular, the entry into the Socialist Party, where Cannon stood virtually alone within the Trotskyist movement in articulating uh, a, a perspective on how the entry was to be conducted that stepped outside of a New York-centered approach um, that was put forward, not just by Shackman, but was embraced for a time by uh, um, uh, Arnie Swabeck 
uh, that certainly had uh, James Burnham support uh, and that uh, really resonated with much of the New York uh, youth of the time. And their perspective was to orient towards uh, what they considered to be uh, the left uh, elements uh, within the Socialist Party leadership in New York City. Uh, a group, first of all, known as the Militants. Uh, they, they then uh, shifted names over time. But the significant point is, is that Shackman and others oriented almost entirely uh, towards a left leadership within the Socialist Party. And Cannon, who I think thought that this might have been uh, an approach uh, in the very beginnings of the discussions around entryism, soon uh, came to realize that this was a dead end, that the militants, the clarityites, as, the, as some of them were later called, would in effect uh, block against uh, um, the Trotskyist uh, left wing within the Socialist Party after the entry and that they would align always with the more conservative elements who were drifting towards uh, a, quote, organic unity uh, with the Stalinists in this period as well, uh, in the, in the, in the, you know, once the Popular Front had been declared in, you know, after 1935. Cannon thought that the work that needed to be done was to actually build the Socialist Party and build its left-wing militants be they youth or in the, uh, in the trade unions or in various other uh, social movement causes. And he actively pursued this when he went out to the West Coast in 1936, 1937. He established a uh, dramatically successful uh, agitational paper, Labor Action. Uh, he worked in the, uh, with, closely with uh, um, militants in the Pacific uh, Sailors in, in Union. Uh, and he uh, campaigned there for Norman Thomas and for the, for the Socialist Party in elections, but he, but he actually did the work of building back the, uh, um, the Socialist Party into a position of some uh, um, significance in California where it had been really uh, um, in, a, in a period of decline uh, by uh, 1936. Um, and so uh, his unique contribution was to push uh, the Trotskyist movement away from reliance on a left leadership and into uh, mass work in the Socialist Party to actually build the Socialist Party. This casts a whole new light on the notion that Trotskyists went in simply to wreck and split uh, the Socialist Party, which is uh, a fiction that both Trotsky and Cannon contributed to somewhat with statements they made in the aftermath of uh, the expulsion of the Trotskyists um, in 1937. But during the, the practice that Cannon uh, you know, put in place, this was not what was going on. Uh, yes, there were uh, um, significant uh, and heated discussions about policies and practices uh, that pitted Cannon against uh, right-wingers and centrists within the Socialist Party. But he also won over a significant sector of left-wingers, of youth, of militants. Uh, and he did that because he did the work. He did the work, and he put himself in it 150%. Uh, and uh, this, I think, uh, um, was what contributed as much as uh, Shackman's alliances with uh, Socialist Party youth in New York to the recruits that Trotskyism was able to bring uh, um, to their banner when they were in fact expelled, uh, which of course did happen, and which Trotsky and Cannon had predicted would happen, but no one really knew how long that was going to last, how long that would take. Um, uh, so in all of this, Cannon kept alive the promise and the potential of revolutionary socialism, uh, he challenged capitalism in its moment of great crisis without succumbing uh, to either the lures of Stalinism or social democracy. Um, he, he combated uh, both uh, opportunism and sectarianism, and he held to a very uh, um, principled uh, rep politics of revolutionary possibility. And in this canon was, I think, 
uh, uh, an exemplary leader. And uh, um, I'm going to just take a second. I have to pull something up on another computer. I want to just take this opportunity to read, if I could, um, the concluding uh, paragraph to this uh, volume on canon and the emergence of Trotskyism in the U.S. So just excuse me for a second. Okay, my old eyes can see this. So this is, this is the conclusion to the book. Uh, at a 60th birthday celebration in 1950, uh, Cannon recalled how he and Rose Karstner uh, had confronted their break from Stalinism in the, in the, in the 1930s. Uh, when we were 40, he wrote, we, we took stock of the situation at that time. That was when we had been expelled from the Communist Party for defending the program of Trotsky, and we had to start all over again. We were 40, that's older than 20, and a little tired. We realized that revolution is rather a young people's occupation, something like athletics. But we had to recognize that the movement depended upon us more than ever, and that we had to make uh, an exception of ourselves. So we said, we'll give 10 more years uh, to the party. Now those 10 years were indeed, in Cannon's words, busy and active ones. There seemed no time to count them. When they were over, Cannon was older again, but he was proud that he had carried forward the socialist aspirations of his youth, that he had personally provided the American left with a red thread of revolutionary continuity. Every man's younger self, uh, uh, let's see, every man's younger self is his better self, Cannon, Cannon insisted. He had come out of Rosedale, Kansas, a 20-year-old wobbly, looking for truth and justice. He found answers in the Russian Revolution, and he remained committed to its purpose rather than acquiescing in its demise, which he experienced over the course of the mid to late 1920s. Trotskyism provided Cannon, who came to the politics of the left opposition cautiously uh, and uh, carefully and slowly with an understanding of how to uh, revive the promise of 1917. He never found it possible to even think of renouncing my citizenship in the socialist future of humanity, he wrote. Cannon thus gave his 10 more years to building the revolutionary party that he saw as necessary to the creation of that golden future that Jack London uh, once wrote. Uh, uh, yeah, that Jack Lond London once wrote uh, as having no servants, not but the service of love. In the process, James Cannon helped transform the development of the American left, leaving a militant revolutionary footprint on the landscape of class relations in the world's most powerful uh, capitalist nation. Thanks very much.